Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you, depending on where in the world you are joining today's webinar from, and welcome to this month's Next Level Purchasing Association Members Only Webinar. My name is Charles Dominic. I am the President and Chief Procurement Officer of the Next Level Purchasing Association. I am delighted that you've joined me today. And in a few moments, I will be uh, introducing a special guest presenter that we will have uh, speaking with you today. So uh, today's uh, webinar is called uh, Talent Acquisition Trends in Procurement. Um, those of you who have earned the SPSM certification or who are enrolled in the SPSM certification program um, can download a copy of today's slides right now from the library tab within the members area of the Next Level Purchasing Association website. If you are not uh, SPSM certified or enrolled in the SPSM certification program, a little bit later um, we will be uh, going over how you can get access to the slides and a replay of today's webinar as well as uh, almost all of them that we have done in the past. So um, I am now going to introduce and turn over uh, presentation mode to our guest presenter. A uh, very special guest presenter is Dina Marie Bavona. She, she is the Director of Talent Acquisition at GEP, and uh, she will be leading you through today's webinar. And at the end of today's webinar, you will have the opportunity to ask questions directly from Dina, and she will be delighted to answer them. So without any further ado, please allow me to introduce our guest presenter, Dina Marie Bavona. Thanks, Charles. Appreciate it. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us this morning, this evening, wherever you are. Um, hopefully, everybody can see my screen at this point. Um, Actually, Dina, if you could just uh, do the share screen button, I think we'll be in good shape. All right. Quick start, share screen. There, there you go. go. Sorry about that. That's okay. How about now? Are we good? That looks good. Awesome. So thanks again. I appreciate it, Charles. Thank you very much for inviting me to do this webinar. Uh, very exciting uh, to be here. Uh, hopefully this will be one of many that we'll be able to produce together. Um, today, I just want to kind of talk to you a little bit about GEP. My name is Dina. As you mentioned, I'm the Director of Talent Acquisition um, for a global e-procurement organization. We are GEP Worldwide. Uh, our focus has, has been procurement. A uh, little bit about myself, I've been doing talent acquisition in some way, shape, or form, uh, as well as learning and development for about 13 and a half years at this point. I uh, joined GEP about, uh, about a year and a half ago, give or take, um, and it's been uh, one hell of a ride. So it's, I've done procurement um, talent acquisition for quite some time prior to that and also dabbled in various other areas. So my talent acquisition expertise uh, does range from marketing to uh, everything in the procurement arena. So invite everybody to please uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. We'd love to, uh, to talk to you a little bit further. If you have any questions regarding this, and we'll be, have an opportunity to review that at the end of the, the webinar. A um, little bit about GEP, give you some ideas to who we are. Again, we're a global e-procurement organization, if you haven't heard of us. We do have a proprietary platform that we are incredibly proud of called Smart by GEP. Um, we have been very, very fortunate to have been the recipient of several awards in the last several years that have really kind of put, I think, GEP on the map. Uh, just to give you some sort of an understanding, uh, Vanguard, we are a Vanguard consulting leader. We won the top supply chain consulting firm last year. We are an Epic Procurement Award winner of 2015, and we have other additional awards, um, such as our CEO, Sabash, has just won Entrepreneur of the Year from EMY, which is a wonderful honor. Um, and in addition to that, Deloitte uh, has voted us top, top 500 fastest growing technology firms as well. Um, so, and then it's thanks to our, our tireless efforts of our technology team um, in the U.S. as well as overseas. Uh, so check us out. Our website is GEP.com and our proprietary platform can be showcased, is showcased on smartbygep.com. So today I want to talk with, uh, with you a little bit about and what we're going to talk in the next half hour or so. Um, Talent has changed, procurement has certainly changed over the last several years. So we're gonna kind of give you a small overview of, of the top traits that we've seen in procurement professionals these days. And these are people that have been 
uh, or professionals that have been incredibly successful within our organization. Uh, but as well, you know, some of this is a secret sauce in, in some other organizations as well. Um, I encourage you all to take a moment and reflect, um, you know, and see how, how does this fit? You know, what I'm, what I'm talking about may not be direct, may not directly apply to your current position or your current location, or your current company, but also think of it from a 360 degree perspective and how can some of the things that we're going to talk about later today uh, really kind of uh, make an impact in the talent acquisition of your organization. So uh, we went through the welcome there, top traits of, of uh, procurement professionals. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, skills and certifications that I like to see on a resume personally. Um, and then understanding today's talent, as we said earlier, uh, definitely has changed recently. Um, and then skills versus culture fit, which is always incredibly important and, and a very interesting debate sometimes. Uh, and then questions and answers, of course, will open that up at the end. Um, so let's roll. So first thing I'd like to do is find out um, a little bit about you guys. Can you tell me by just quickly typing in the chat box really quick, give me an understanding as to where, you know, what your role in your organization is. Are you a buyer? Are you someone who's just specifically talent acquisition? Um, what is your role in the organization there? Just so we have, and then tell me where you're from, if you could. That would be uh, great to, to understand that. All right. Charles, for some reason I, I'm unable to view um, not in full screen. Is there any way we can you can kind of read off there? Sure, absolutely. Um, Thank you. A few responses <laughs> rolling in. We have Lisa Krupp, uh, who is a buyer. Kellen Faluka, who is indirect senior buyer for U.S. and Canada. Uh, okay. Rachel Krusko, buyer two in Philadelphia, PA. Tim Kluwer, sourcing analyst. Um, Mike Dobbins, a buyer in Colorado. Um, Tim chimes in again, his location is in Houston. Uh, Devin Poe is a purchasing specialist in Portland, Oregon. Pamela Lewis is a supervisor of technical operations from Washington, D.C. Um, Keith Tucarello is corporate purchasing manager in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So that's, uh, that's a sample of what we have uh, that has come in so far. Great, awesome. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much, and welcome to you all once again. Um, so a lot of this this is actually going to be pretty relevant uh, for procurement professionals in general. A lot of what GEP does and a lot of what we do is the consulting side, um, but we also do have a very strong VTO side of the house. So it seems like we're, um, from our terms, that's where a lot of you individuals are. You're kind of in the trenches. You're the ones that make the thing, make it work. Uh, we can put all the strategy we want to uh, to a particular project, but if you're not in the trenches and, and you can't execute on that strategy, then obviously all, all that work at the top means kind of nothing. So you guys are really the, uh, you know, the oil that makes the wheel kind of run successfully. So, um, so as far as procurement traits are concerned, here's uh, pretty much a top 10 that we see uh, as well as other procurement professionals have, have mentioned here. I'm just going to go through them and I'll talk one by one. So obviously strategic industry management is always always on on, uh, on the top of the list there, right? You have to understand the industry. You also have to understand how to be strategic about the approach to buying. You know, pr uh, procurement has transformed so uh, so much in the last maybe five to ten years, if not even more so. Um, in the last five years, I think it's even changed dramatically, and we've seen kind of segueing into the next bullet point category management here. Um, there is a much more strategic approach these days, and to uh, to have an individuals come in, uh, you're not just a buyer anymore. You're not just procuring goods. You are how to procure goods, and especially when the bottom line is is going to be affected, how to save. Uh, and there's you know there's a lot of strategy that does go into that. So the category management role has been kind of tweaked a little bit. It used to you know years ago it was just a bunch of buyers in a room somewhere trying to find what the company needed. And now there's a high level, you know, do you combine vendors because they, you'll, you'll have buying power? Do you, um, do you outsource? Do you, what, you know, what are some of the results there? What are some of the strategies uh, that go along with that category management? Um, successful procurement uh, professionals also understand the full category. What we're seeing these days is category management has transitioned and there are more and more demand for category manager subject matter experts. So, especially in the consulting world, um, but even in industry as well, um, you know, the idea behind someone being a generalist, a, a category generalist, is a great thing. 
However, if you can go ahead and find your niche and find something that you love to do and become what we call a subject, an SME, subject matter expert within that category, this is for us, uh, you know, one of the top things in demand. Uh, and speaking specifically to category management, I will say that the top two that I see consistently is individuals that have experience in marketing uh, and IT. And if you take a look at the grand scheme of things, these are areas, uh, in addition to logistics, obviously, that change on a, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. IT, uh, <laughs> IT has changed and it changes so very rapidly that someone who just dabbles in IT procurement may not be the best fit uh, for someone to run an, enti an entire IT category depending upon the approach to the procurement strategy. So as far as top uh, Trace, my suggestion here is, you know, category management and an area of subject matter expertise is really what we're looking at these days and where we see uh, a lot of success coming out. Uh, marketing specifically, as I mentioned, has, uh, has a tremendous, uh, tremendous demand these days. And if, if you realize anything about marketing, know that it has changed tremendously. It used to be you put a, an ad in a piece of, you know, on a piece of paper and send it out to someone in a magazine and that was marketing. These days with digital strategy and, and uh, digital, a, a lot of companies moving to digital spend, um, there's a lot to be desired here in the individuals that understand the marketing categories. And what we're finding is these individuals understand marketing but don't understand procurement specifically. Um, project management, moving on to the third bullet point here, project management is something that I think kind of goes in hand, you know, with the strategy and, you know, especially category management. Um, but project management specifically is, is an area where we are looking to really have individuals that are strong in driving projects that can execute on a timely basis. Uh, time is money, as I say. So making sure that your deadlines are met, making sure that your targets are met, that all comes, you know, it, it's a team effort um, on a daily basis for most. But for project managers, it has to be, it has to be held, uh, you know, who have to be held accountable. This is something that we look for. Um, you know, strong project management, can you lead, can you deliver on time, and can you hit the target savings? Uh, and I think this is a, a trait, you know, across various categories uh, or various industries that is, is in demand more than anything as well, um, long term. Uh, relationship management for us is tremendous. So we, you can always achieve a lot more with, uh, with honey than you do with vinegar. So. Being able to understand what I call the e-link, the emotional link of the client, right? Uh, whether your client is internal or whether your client is external, whether you're in consulting or whatever your, your background might be, um, the relationship management piece on the client side as well as the vendor side is key. Uh, people will, you know, if they like you, if you're personable, if you're able to build that relationship, understand what makes them tick, understand what, you know, what makes your stakeholders, um, you know, get up in the morning and, and what drives them. And, and, you know, that is, is a basic, um, you know, fundamental that I think every procurement professional should certainly have here. Uh, negotiation skills, of course. This is something that it, we're going to get into a little bit further um, in one of the one of the future slides here. But negotiation skills, obviously, it's it's what we do. Uh, our company logo is saving is saving is believing. Um, much of what we we do is is save our our organizations or our clients a lot of money. So how how strong are your negotiation yeah, negotiation tactics? How you know how are you able to uh, really leverage your vendor relationships and that I think negotiation tactics and relationship management. If there's no relationship built, then I don't believe that negotiation skills are, uh, can go as far as if you do have a solid relationship with that vendor or that client holder, uh, that client stakeholder. Uh, financial acumen, obviously, you're dealing with numbers and purchases and, and dollars and cents. So this for, for us is a, a no-brainer here. Um, you must be great with numbers, spreadsheets, and, and things of that nature. Um, analytical skills, again, uh, once again, kind of goes in that. But different from financial analytical is how, you know, how can you analyze um, the entire procurement category? How can you analyze the entire procurement spend? Um, you know, where is it that, we that you can improve upon? Where can you combine? Where can you uh, cut costs? Um, these things are incredibly important. Having a full, I think, 360-degree approach to what you're doing is, is kind of how I, um, how I view this there, really understanding it from different areas, from different aspects as far as the analytics are concerned. Uh, aptitude for technology, this is huge. Um, 
you know, most companies these days are moving towards technology, whether they're cloud-based or something along those lines, mobile. And it also gives us the ability here to, you know, really have a collaborative workforce and, and a collaborative um, relationship with the, you know, the, the buyers, with the vendors, and also with our stakeholders. Um, so for us, it's, it's incredibly effective. It definitely, special, you know, uh, gives the ability to do that in-depth reports and in-depth specialized knowledge uh, by basically translating the information into responsive procurement solutions. So technology being able to have leverage this and in any solution, any way, shape, or form, this is certainly uh, incredibly important to uh, or uh, procurements in general. Um, and then results focused, obviously. Your targets at the end of the day, we all probably have targets to meet, I would say. And if you don't meet those targets, obviously things are affected. The company, uh, the company is affected. The spend is affected, and, and, and all of that. So results oriented is something that we certainly want to see. You know, do you have your eye on the ball? Is it, you know, are you focused on the end game? There, there are obviously steps that we need to take to make sure you get to the end game, uh, and to do so most efficiently and effectively as possible. But are you, you know, are you driven by by the the dollar amount at the savings line at the end of the day? Um, this is incredibly important for us as well. And then, of course, your professionalism and integrity. This is something, uh, although it is last on the list here, something that we are, you know, adamant about within GEP. Your integrity must not waver. Um, you know, you're dealing with finances, you're dealing with a lot of personal and or a lot of uh, proprietary data, obviously. Um, so we want to make sure that our that this data and these details are not going to get into the, the wrong hands. Also, professionalism-wise, you know, continuously we send a lot of our clients or a lot of our candidates, uh, I'm sorry, consultants out to our client sites. We certainly need to make sure that they're you know they're not going they're going to act professional and they're going to conduct themselves in a you know a very uh, professional manner here. So this is something that is. Kind of a, um, a given uh, to some extent, but you also want to be able to make sure that their behavior and their ability to think and speak accordingly is, is there. Um, and then, of course, for us, you know, we believe at GEP that success is always about the people. Uh, we actually call ourselves a big, we are one big, <laughs> one big family. Um, and the, I think at the end of all of this, for, from a GEP perspective, we, I can honestly say that um, w without our people and without the individuals that, that work with us, without the team members, we truly would not have evolved to the organization that we have today. So moving forward a little bit, something else we look into, skills and certifications. Um, I'm sure a lot of us have heard of these. So Six Sigma, there's you know, Green Belt, Black Belt, all of those different versions, depending upon which area of expertise you have. Uh, there is a CMC, Certified Management Consulting. Uh, project management professionals, again, I, I've uh, talked about this a little bit earlier. Project management, I think, is something that is overlooked uh, to some extent and really having understanding and formal training of project management. This is an area where I think we can, uh, including myself, uh, I'll, I'll say that I think that, you know, project management is something that should we should consistently shine a light on. Uh, and the PMP certification is, is very important. It takes several years to, to gain some PMP certification, depending upon the areas of uh, project or the hours of the project. Uh, projects that you've completed. And then, of course, senior professional and supply chain management uh, and certifications as well. Uh, the reason, you know, I used to, years ago, I would, uh, I did some IT technology at training, and I also was a talent acquisition director for them um, at that point for an IT company. And one of the things that we looked at, um, you know, was certifications. Are they worthwhile? Is it, is it, is it different for somebody to have a certification versus not? And the answer to this is yes, of course, it shows dedication. It certainly shows the ability to complete things, much like a degree or something along those lines. But more importantly, um, because the job market is so incredibly competitive these days, uh, just to give you an understanding, I think Indeed, for every one job posting that's out there, um, Indeed gave the statistics. I think for every one job posting, there's uh, hundreds, if not thousands of people, depending upon the area that people are looking at, that job seekers are looking at. Just if you type in today, um, in Indeed, if you go to Indeed.com and you type in procurement nationwide, you will see that there's over 52,000 jobs that mention procurement available in the U.S. Uh, from a job seeker perspective, there's probably at least 10 to 15 uh, individuals looking at each of those jobs just in procurement that have relevant expertise. So let's say it comes down to uh, the 
the area of now I'm, I'm a hiring manager and I need to take a look at, you know, candidate A, who is someone who is able to, you know, pre perform on the job, has all the necessary um, skills that I would want, or can, and certainly salary ranges in line and all of those things, location and all the other areas. Or, I, and I have somebody, a, a candidate B, who has a PMP certification or is certified uh, as, a, as a professional in supply chain management. If there's no other differentiation, then I've, I've myself have, uh, have done this several times, if there's no other um, differentiation within the skill sets there, I would, nine times out of 10, always opt for the individual that has the certification. Um, I feel that they are, at the end of all that, they learn, they end up being just a, a more viable employee and they can bring some additional value to the team. Uh, and teach, uh, I've also had them, you know, kind of teach their team as well, some of the things that they learn in these certification courses. Um, so those are some areas that we have, you know, as far as some of the traits that we're looking for professional, uh, you know, professionals at this point. Uh, seeking to understand, I think one of the things from a talent perspective is, you know, as I face some of the challenges um, of growing an organization, and, and GEP has experienced a tremendous amount of growth uh, in the last several years. So, you know, what we've found is that there's a, obviously a talent shortage there. So how do we combat that talent, you know, the, um, the shortage there, and, and how do we move through these areas and say, okay, you know, this is how we can, we can obtain new talent in new, different, new ways aside from just posting something on a job board. Uh, that's always not, the, you know, not always a viable option there. So for, uh, for us, I think, you know, I read an article I wanted to just uh, mention it while I was kind of preparing for this webinar. It was by Susan Avery at, at my purchasing center, and she had written an article that says, that we need, you know, five trends impacting procurement professionals. And I think this is pretty important for us here because I think in order to be able to attract the proper talent, we have to understand the talent first. We have to understand the audience that we have today. We have to understand uh, what it is that's their driving factors and what it is that, that they're going to expect when they come through the door. That if a corporation or uh, an organization can, um, can provide those things, then attracting your talent becomes even, you know, a little bit easier. Um, so I will say that the top five that she mentions here are, are pretty much on point, and I'll go through a little bit about what she means here. But she mentioned, uh, you know, millennials. That is a huge word we have these, these days, right? So millennials and, and Generation uh, Z and, and all of those, they've changed the workforce. They're, ever, they're changing the workforce because our children and, and our, uh, you know, the individuals that we work with today are, are so focused in technology. Companies weren't necessarily ready for this. Although we did have the Y2K and, and you know, the dot-com boost and all that stuff, companies internally um, have not been, you know, some of them have not been moving towards the drive of technology, at least as far as what the, uh, you know, what the millennials are, are requesting. So just to give you an understanding, everything is about ease of use. So actually the economist reported millennials occupy about 34% of business positions in 2015. That's a pretty large number for individuals that really just graduated college, right? Um, and then the 29, and that is actually in comparison to about 29% that are still baby boomers out there. So what this has done is change the expectation. So anywhere, anytime, any place, desktop, tablet, mobile, these are the ways that, that millennials these days expect to be able to access. Uh, and if we're going to attract talent that's going to bring our organization into the future, we certainly need to be able to work and comply with some of these demands out there because it's not just one or two people, but it is certainly the next generation of, of new hires that are coming into play here. Um, another area that you mentioned was cloud. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about this as well, you know, adaption of technology. So cloud to improve partner collaboration in the supply chain area. This is, this is something that, you know, organizations are not necessarily ready for. Uh, there are many organizations that are still hovering, you know, whether or not to go into the cloud or not go into the cloud, and why not? Um, you know, the, the cloud has opened up so many doors for so many organizations if it's used efficiently and effectively. Um, and these are things, again, that the new, new generation of qualified individuals that are going to come join your company are very much, um, you know, looking for. How do we, how are we, able to collaborate in real time? How can we do so regardless of our location on the globe? Um, you know, all of those things. So these are things that companies had to start looking at, and especially GEP, um, you know, we had to start looking at too. How do we put our systems into play in addition from our technology platform? 
uh, internally and house to make sure that this is a collaborative environment. We're a global company. We have about 12 locations across the globe. Uh, and on any given moment, I can work, I can be working with uh, London or India or Prague or Costa Rica. Um, and, and it is incredibly helpful to have that uh, information readily, readily available. Um, the third thing that she mentions here, and I think this is very relevant given the news of the latest Yahoo breach, um, data. You know, th some of the things that this is going to start to bring up now is when we talk about supplier contracts, uh, tougher negotiating terms of supplier contracts because of these data breaches, because, you know, our suppliers hold a lot of data information. So what, um, you know, as far as terms negotiated and things of that nature, where, you know, how do you toughen up your supplier contracts? How do you make sure that these things are actually, um, are, you know, as foolproof as possible? Um, the third, uh, the fourth thing here would be automation of service. You know, we see it every day in our everyday life. Um, and I think this comes into that always on type of, um, type of mentality. So how do we take things <clears throat> and go from a, you know, a self, I guess a self serving or a full service where it used to be we would have to hold the client's hands or we'd have to hold the stakeholders' hands to empowering them to do it on them, themselves. Uh, and I was, I was saying earlier today, we see it every day. At, you know, we have those now self checkout counters at Walmart or at, um, you know, at our grocery stores. And that's just because, let's face it, people are sometimes impatient. <laughs> they don't want to wait in the line. They want to be able to just do it themselves and, you know, purchase the, the you know, two items that they have out there and, and just and walk away and not interact with somebody. And this is certainly um, has a lot to do with the individuals that are coming in from the millennial generation. And, um, you know, you have the, old, the old, uh, older generations that prefer the individual on the other side of the fence. But right now, the name of the game is the automation of services and, and how that they can become self-serving. Um, and, you know, even from a recruiting perspective, we see this in, uh, LinkedIn recruiter, a uh, perfect example is how does, how does that tool, how does that work for me while I sleep? How does that help me find the individuals that I'm looking for? How does it, and it certainly does. It gives us suggestions. I'm able to put out uh, specific searches and things of that nature there. Um, so this is becoming tremendous uh, in, in the workforce um, nowadays for all organizations that are offering services. Um, artificial intelligence and procurement. So this is something that is, um, is pretty important uh, moving forward. AI is, has really kind of taken a, a huge, huge, it's been, it's been front and center um, in a lot of debates recently and a lot of, um, you know, conversations that we've had as well. Um, so through something that they call natural language processing, uh, machine learning, it kind of drives automation of processes and it gives insight um, in traditional, you know, in time and labor intensive procurement environment. So for us, this is, you know, um, it does relate a little bit to contract management as well, but this portion of it is basically goes back to the digital aspect of things. So AI is probably something that a lot of you have not even thought of these days, but this is something that is in certain areas affecting. Um, so I wanted to just mention this particular, uh, these particular trends, because in order to do so, now the question that we ask is, how do we, how do we look at these five trends and, and try and understand or predict talent acquisition in the future? Um, I think there's a couple of different ways that we can kind of combat this and we can use this huge generation of millennials that can actually work with us and, and kind of, you know, help us build a better organization. Um, you know, we have to break the mold. So talent acquisition has to evolve. Just as procurement has evolved, our approach to these individuals have to evolve. So I love this quote from Socrates. I'm, I'm pretty big into quotes. Uh, it says, the secret of change is to focus all of your energy and not fighting the old, but on building the new. If an organization is going to consistently hold on to the old way of doing things, one of the worst things that they say uh, is, I believe that, you know, we should do it this way because we've always done it this way. But there's always room for improvement. No matter how great you've always done things, you can always change and you always evolve, and, and we absolutely have to. Um, talk about breaking the talent mold. I think that there has been, there's always been internships and things of that nature out there. Uh, I think today, especially from our perspective, from a GEP perspective, we have an, a tremendous focus on, you know, on what we call campus recruiting. So for us, this works out um, in several different ways. 
ultimately what we are, are working on today is building, before we go ahead and recruit from campus hires, what we're working on today is we're looking to build a solid internship program here. Um, you know, we know that millennials march to a very different beat of a very different drum, obviously. Um, and I think this allows us to get a little bit of a sense uh, as to if we do internships and we do them maybe a multi-year internship even. Um, I, I do believe that individuals that are leaving uh, leaving school these days or leaving college these days without any sort of viable internship within their industry, junior and senior year, are at a tremendous disadvantage. Um, so I encourage a lot of students these days that I speak with uh, during our OCR recruiting and things of that nature that are still just in their junior year to make sure that they have at least some sort of a summer internship or even uh, a winter internship where they have some viable exposure. Uh, because if you go out into the workforce these days without any experience and just a degree, then we kind of know where, where you're going to end up um, in that in that regard. Um, and nine times out of ten, it's unfortunately these days it's working at the quick check uh, or some other organization, you know, some other uh, you know nine hourly type of of a job, not related to the probably thousands upon thousands of dollars you spent in college education. Um, so I think this is going to help moving forward, uh, again, breaking the, the mold, fostering the workforce. It helps from, the, from the, the perspective of the candidate also because it gives them an understanding as to what to expect in a corporate environment. A lot of these individuals, the first time that they've ever stepped foot in the corporate environment has, is going to be at the, this internship level. And there's a tremendous learning curve there. Um, and it gives from a corporation perspective the ability to test drive. Um, you know, test drive the employee, are they a good fit, are, or test drive the intern, I should say. Are they a good fit? Is this going to work? Can you teach them? Um, and then it also introduces from the, from the other side, from the candidate side, company loyalty. Um, a lot of these individuals are going to be very grateful that you actually are able to give them the ability uh, to understand what, 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 it, what it's like in the quote-unquote real world. Um, another area that we've kind of looked into on our side is what we call boomerang employees. So how do you, you know, how do you get the people that you need in-house in without the large number of, you know, large expense or without, you know, with, with streamlining? Um, a lot of companies are going to what they call boomerang employees, and this is something that GEP does as well. So these are pretty much retired employees who have left the company because they didn't want to do a, you know, a, a five day a week, you know, travel model anymore, or they wanted to just kind of sit back and, and take it easy and consult on their own. Um, GEP never throws away their employees, especially even if they retire, uh, and especially if they were, they were good and with us for a long period of time. We will always maintain relationships with these individuals because in our line of work especially, uh, subject matter experts are, are huge. Um, and someone who has 15 to 20 years of experience in a particular industry or, um, or in a particular area is invaluable, um, you know, to kind of just let, let walk away. So we will bring them back on a contract basis. We will, you know, uh, if they're open to it. And, and a lot of them really are. They, they like the fact that they can still stay engaged and, you know, keep their mind sharp and moving things forward. And it also helps the organization out in combating some of the talent shortage that we have out there. You can't, regardless of how much training you put somebody through, you cannot, uh, you can't really take things to the next level and, and give them 20 years of experience in, you know, in 20 days of classes. So um, I do think, though, the, the speaking about training, that it is incredibly important to continuously train your employees, um, and especially at the internship level and above. Even if they don't join your organization, uh, we do believe in training our interns to some extent because that will always kind of sit with them. Um, and that will certainly be a leg up in, in being able to get them a, a position out there. Um, so in addition to some of the trends that we're seeing there, right, uh, we also hear about the work, the workplace. So there's ways in attracting the newer talent or the, uh, the newer talent, the millennials and, and things of that nature and, and some um, other ways that we also from a workplace perspective, we, are, we need to kind of change the way we think about going to work. Uh, many of us, are are in an office nine to five every single day, you know, still with, or within a, cu a cubicle or something along those lines. But that is changing. If you take a look at a lot of the most successful companies out there, um, you know, they're offering different things like flexible workforce. 
a lot of a lot of families these days, it's very hard to have a, I'm, I'm a single parent myself. So it's very hard to balance. I'm so incredibly blessed that my organization allows the flexibility if I need to work from home or uh, if I need to take, um, you know, take a day to do something with my daughter. They offer that, they want that. I can even bring her into my office um, on a daily basis if I needed to, if she's off of school or something like that. So this is some, you know, breaking the workplace mold. Um, you know, an area where companies have to learn in order to be competitive out there, they have to learn to be more flexible. Um, you know, work on client site. We, our consultants do work four days a week. They, you know, they work four days a week on client site. On Friday, we don't necessarily require them to come into the office uh, because that's a, a day of autonomy. Finish up your client projects, do it, do what it is that you need to do. And I think it also gives a level of trust uh, that the company trusts you to make sure that your client has what it needs and that, you know, the client is trusting you, obviously, to make sure they have what they need and, and to do your job as well. Um, telecommuting for us, you know, uh, there was a huge, speaking of Yahoo, there was a huge um, debate that this kind of brought up, which is when the CEO of Yahoo came in and decided that she was going to kill telecommuting within Yahoo. And clearly, as of two weeks ago, I believe it was, we, really, we realized where it has brought that company at this point in time. Um, it's one thing to always revert back to what has worked and, you know, the understanding of people having to be in the office to make sure that they're working. But if you use technology and you embrace it and you move into those areas, I think this is ultimately, um, you know, where we're headed here, the ability to telecommute. And most people that are buyers, most people that are uh, procurement professionals, all of that data they're purchasing, all of that is done online anyway. Um, so what is it, you know, for us in, in moving the trend to allowing people to telecommute. And maybe it's not every day, but maybe it is one or two days a week just to make sure that commute and, and the stress level is, is a little bit uh, less on your in, employee. Um, innovated office design, right? So workstations are different. Everyone's working these days, no more big bulky lap or big bulky, um, you know, desktops that we have to work on. I, you know, I have a 13 inch, little Lenovo ThinkPad that I won't go anywhere without. I love it to death. It turns into a tablet for me, or it is what it is, and uh, it works. It's functional. I don't need a big desktop. I don't need a tremendous screen. I can do everything I need right from my cute little, my, my cute little ThinkPad. Um, you know, so the need for those big cubicles and those big desks, they're, they're not there anymore. Uh, nor is the joy of going in and seeing an office full of cubicles. <laughs> so Google has actually done something a little bit different. Uh, which I like to bring attention to because we're starting, um, we're actually rebuilding one of our offices uh, overseas and we've kind of taken a little bit of a different approach and we're really excited about how to, uh, how this is going to work with our, uh, our team members over there. But Google does something called the Google Work Pod. Um, they have every, actually every floor in their building in Manhattan, I think it's about 13 or 14 floors or something along those lines, but every floor has a different theme. And this is an actual picture of one of the, uh, one of the areas. Um, as far as the work, uh, work pod is concerned. This is really cool. You want people to be able to come to work and enjoy their environment. It just makes things a lot easier. And if you're, if you're more of a uh, casual kind of an environment, it'll make it easier to attract that younger talent, the, you know, the talent that can really kind of bring, uh, make, it, make a huge impact. Um, and of, co of course, junior talent, um, you know, from a cost perspective, since savings is believing for GEP, the, you know, it is much less expensive and much more effective to hire somebody who is brand new or fresher uh, that has a strong passion for their career uh, and kind of groom them into your culture. So this is a good segue into this next question. Uh, given a choice, would you hire based on skill set or cultural fit? Um, for talent acquisition, this is sometimes a challenge uh, some hiring managers don't always really see that a skill set can be taught and a cultural fit cannot be learned. Um, this is tremendous, and this is always a very interesting conversation to have. So, uh, Charles, I don't know if you're uh, still on, but are you able to kind of see some of the, the answers rolling in? Uh, let's see, and if uh, no answers have rolled in yet, folks, um, just uh, turn your attention to the Q&A section on the, uh, in the corner of your WebEx console, and uh, just type in your uh, answers in that section there, hit the send button, we'll take a look at them. So again, the question is, if given a choice, would you hire based on skill set or cultural fit? 
So it looks like uh, Lisa Krupp is the first one to answer that question. And Lisa has an interesting uh, response, and that is both. Uh, but um, which, which really you do have to, um, you know, you do have to have a little bit of both. But if you had to choose one, which which do you think is more important? And uh, it looks like uh, Tim Kluwer, uh says characteristics. Option C. Uh, Layla Callahan <laughs> says both. Um, Luis Magana says skill sets. Uh, Devin, Devin Poe says cultural fit. Skills can be learned, culture cannot. Uh, Bill Nicole says skill set. Um, Dhruv Bhatnagar says skill set. Uh, John Dreyer says cultural fit. Uh, Paul Fleming says skill set. So it seems like we have folks on, uh, on both sides of the fence there, Dina. Great. So I will tend to agree to some extent um, that skill set isn't important, but if I had to choose on a daily basis who would fit well within my organization, is it going to be somebody with skill sets or is it going to be somebody with a cultural fit? I would, without a doubt, um, every single time choose somebody who is a cultural fit. Um, so, and here's why, and the stats support this, right? So 80% of all employers say that there is a cultural fit is a top priority. So I agree with, was it Devin who said that? Um, you can teach skill set. You can teach somebody code. You could teach somebody the, you know, the STAR method for procurement. You could teach them how, you know, the approach or the methodology. What you can't teach them is how to be an entrepreneur. You can't teach them to go ahead and survive in an entrepreneurial type of environment, which is what GEP is, um, you know, if they need, if certain individuals need some hand-holding. Um, I will tell you that, you know, it is very fast-paced in the consulting world, especially in the technology arena. Uh, so for us, it, it's always about, you know, can somebody handle the uh, moving to, uh, can somebody handle the cultural fit? Some people need a lot of structure. GEP is more of a free-flowing kind of an organization. Uh, other people, you know, depending upon, it's also about knowing yourself, right, and, and what environment you are able to truly, um, you know, function well in, function and function well in. Uh, and there's no right or wrong at the end of the day for yourself. If you know that you need a structured environment, then, then that is totally cool. If you believe that you can work, work well, being, you know, kind of uh, with, with little management or little micromanaging and, um, you know, then that's, it's all about kind of knowing what environment you're going to work well in it as, as a worker. So specifically, this actually astounded me. I knew it was high. I just didn't know it was this high. But 202% of everybody says companies are, with engaged employees outperform companies with engaged employees by, by 202%. So if you take a look at a company like Google or like a company like um, not Yahoo, but Apple, um, they hire, they will tell you all the time, they'll hire for skills, but they will, more than anything, hire for cultural fit. And, and we actually, uh, even SAP is a huge technology organization. They hire for cultural fit. Culture is so incredibly, incredibly important to them. Uh, they'll train them all day long on skills, but they can't train somebody to be a cultural fit. And then 20% of employees identify that a good, good culture fits are likely to become top performers in the organization. Of course, you're not overcoming anything else. There's, you know, you're, you're jiving with your managers, you're, you're talking with your buyers, you're uh, working with your vendors, and these guys all have an understanding as to the type of organization you are. Uh, and if you jive along well with that cultural fit with your team, things just tend to move a lot, a lot smoother. Um, so <laughs> culture fit is king and queen. Uh, as far as that is concerned. And I think most hiring managers, and especially as things evolve over the next, you know, I think the next five to seven years is going to be very interesting in some of the new technologies that are coming down the pipeline in, in all areas of organization, you know, in industry, especially in procurement. Um, one thing that I think that we are very proud of here at GEP is the ability to say that we are the first cloud-based platform that is out there. Um, that is something that I, and I really feel that moving forward, we, you know, some of the things that we have, we're seeing out there are certainly going to move towards that area of technology and expertise. Um, I think that also from a talent acquisition perspective, the trends are very much these days to look inside, 
um, look inside to your organization. So you, you, if you've hired successfully and you're able to, you know, obviously uh, lower attrition rates and things of that nature, um, you know, who better than to offer employee, you know, offer other people positions than your current employees? Hey, listen, my organization is looking for blah, blah, blah. Do you know anybody? And I think it also gives a better close ratio at the end if somebody is referred. Um, they're more likely from a talent acquisition perspective to take the job if they know somebody who works in-house. Uh, and this, that is uh, recruitment marketing for dummies. Just did a report recently. It says 50% of new hires are from referral, excuse me, referral programs. This also can be used as an added incentive. A lot of companies out there choose to move forward and deal with agencies, um, which is a great, great viable resource. I spent a lot of time on the agency side of the house. Um, you know, in my years of, of 13 years of talent experience, I think agencies can bring tremendous value, uh, but not all organizations have the budget to go out to an agency. On the flip side, if you can take the agency and, you know, the referral fee and go ahead and maybe add it to your current employees, uh, they will see, they will view you as a, a better, a better employer. Uh, you're giving them additional opportunity to make some additional money and, and who wouldn't want that just by sending a resume over. Uh, it shows that you value their opinions. Um, and it also, again, gives a, if you understand that, you know, candidate A is a cultural fit because he knows Joey and Joey, Joey's a perfect, you know, perfect fit for culture, you're able to kind of, uh, kind of draw some conclusions from that perspective. Um, and I think, you know, ultimately, um, just kind of coming up on about 20 after, uh, 20 after 12, so just for the sake of time, wanted to, um, you know, see at this point if there was any sort of questions on anything that we've gone over. All right, everyone. Uh, Dina, thanks for the uh, great presentation. And now's the uh, opportunity to have any questions you have about procurement talent acquisition answered by our guest expert today. Um, please, uh, if you haven't already uh, taken a look at it, take a look at the corner of your WebEx console, and there you'll see a Q&A section and a place for you to type your question and a send button to uh, send that to us. We will read your questions aloud. I'm going to take presentation mode back uh, momentarily. Um, I mentioned a little earlier while we're waiting for uh, while we're waiting for questions to roll in. I'll go over something I mentioned a little earlier, which is how do you get the slides from today's webinar? Well, hang on one second. Allow me to share my screen, and we'll bring uh, that right up for you. All righty. Um, if you're interested in uh, the slides uh, from today's webinar, there. Um, Ah, went back to, did I go to the beginning? I did go to the beginning. I apologize. Let me scroll ahead. Um, hey, this is a fun, quick review here. Um, <clears throat> if uh, you're interested in the slides from today's webinar, you may already be eligible to have them. In fact, they may be waiting for you. If you are in, uh, if you are SPSM certified, or if you're enrolled in the SPSM certification program, or Next Level Purchasing Association's All Access Plan, you can get those slides right now from the library tab in the members area of the nextlevelpurchasing.com website. Now, if you do, uh, do not fit into those three groups, being SPSM certified, enrolled in the SPSM certification program, or enrolled in our All Access Plan, I'll just briefly go over uh, what those uh, plans include. Uh, the SPSM certification program will give you access to all of the, uh, not only the slides and the on-demand replays from today's webinar, but just about every webinar we've done uh, since we started doing them back, I think, in 2011. You'll get the slides and the on-demand replays. You also get a series of templates that we have available for you, like RFP templates, uh, cost savings calculation templates, supplier scorecards, things like that. You'll get trans access to transcriptions from interviews with procurement experts. You'll have access to the six online courses that uh, are required to earn your SPSM certification, and you'll be eligible to complete the SPSM certification. The cost of the SPSM certification program is $1,159 per person, and group discounts are available if you're in a team of four or more that's going to enroll. 
Um, the All Access Plan uh, provides even more value. Not only do you get the slides and on-demand replays from all those webinars, not only do you get all the templates, not only do you get access to the transcriptions for interviews with procurement experts, you have access to all uh, 42 of the Next Level Purchasing Association's online courses and uh, you'll be eligible during your one-year subscription to uh, earn all the SPSM, the higher level SPSM 2, or the highest level SPSM 3 certification, whatever you can fit into that, uh, that time period of your plan. The cost of that is $2,199 per person, and again, group discounts are available to teams of four or more. If you'd like more information about uh, those uh, programs or group discounts, uh, you can get either get in touch with us by phone at uh, country code 1-412-294-1990 or you can email us at help at nextlevelpurchasing.com. We would be happy to discuss those with you. All right, let's see. I do believe some questions have rolled in for Dina, so let's, um, let's go through those now. First question comes from Malia, Maria Milan. Uh, Maria asks, how will you know if they can be a cultural fit with your organization? Dina, what, uh, what are your thoughts on that question? So I think it's about, um, you know, a lot of interviewers for, from my perspective as a, a town acquisition expert, you know, I think a lot of interviewers rely very heavily on questions, right? So relying heavily on questions. I think you can learn a lot from somebody if you just sit back and let them speak, you know, let them talk to you, let them tell you about them, and then you can assess, you understand your culture from an internal perspective. Um, also, you know, their website, um, a lot of their social media can tell you uh, quite a little bit about, you know, if you're a job seeker and you're looking to find, um, you know, there's, there's something called the seven touch points from a recruiting perspective, that every candidate will find at least seven ways uh, to kind of review your organization. And I think you, sh you can tell a lot by the tone of the organization. You clearly know that SAP's culture, although it is very focused on, uh, on the culture and on their environment, their culture is obviously very different than a, you know, than a Google, right? Or, you know, Google's culture is very different than, a, than an IBM or an AP Carney or something along those lines, right? So, you know, you have, I think a lot of things from a job seeker perspective can, can help you there. But from my side of the fence, I'll say just, just the conversation with somebody. Uh, for me, things I look for are someone who has an entrepreneurial type of a spirit, who really doesn't need, you know, who has taken things, um, you know, taking things to the next level as far as being able to be motivated on their, on, you know, themselves and are they able, regardless of title or designation, you know, are they ready, willing, and able to roll up their sleeves and, you know, uh, really jump in wherever the team needs them. So I think that there's, uh, you know, there's, there's other profiles and testing and things like that that other companies do uh, as far as, you know, it's for their applicants. Uh, areas that, you know, will kind of also let us know by pulling the internal piece of the organization, uh, you know, who's successful here, who's not, having them take the, the assessment, uh, behavioral assessment, and then having that compared to some of the applicants, I think will also be a good way if you would like some sort of a technical uh, way to, to assess culture or cultural fit, I should say. So hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> Great answer, Dina, and thank you very much for that question, Maria. Um, Here's an interesting one. This comes from Devin Poe, and Devin asks, do you worry about lack of diversity if your company re relies heavily upon hiring referrals? So uh, that is a really good question, um, and that's something that we are looking at a GEP, from a GEP perspective as well. You know, um, I think that the cultural fit, not everybody, um, it, you know, only has friends of their specific culture. So I, sometimes I can see where, you know, where your question could come into play, but that's also, you know, just because somebody refers um, somebody that they've worked with doesn't mean that talent acquisition has to accept their, their candidacy. That's really where the government, you know, the governing of the talent acquisition department or the recruiters really have to take that just because you ask for a company referral. Um, you know, those things, you know, those referrals or those candidates should certainly be handled with white, you know, uh, white kick gloves to some extent because they are usually a friend or a family member or something like that from a current employee. But it doesn't mean that you have to take that forward. So that is going to be about just, you know, about the discretion of the talent, you know, talent acquisition team. Um, and ultimately, if, that, if that's going to be a fit. So if diversity is a challenge within your organization, then um, that's, 
that's something that you have to govern from in-house, not necessarily. But at the end of all of this, I think that um, cultural fit, as we talked about, and you know, secondary to diversity would be skill sets, uh, is incredibly important. So if somebody has um, has those two things, I think ultimately that's that's what we're looking for there. And you're more likely to find them within the individuals that have been spending 10 years into uh, in, in procurement than you are on a job board to some extent. We're more likely to find a better fit, I should say. Great, thank you, Dina, and thank you, Devin, for the excellent question. Um, next question comes from Dhruv Patnagar, and uh, the question is, can you please give an example of AI used in procurement? Sure. Um, so artificial intelligence we use every day right now. If you have a smartphone and you use Surrey, or if you're on Windows and you use Cortana, these are things of artificial intelligence. So how this is going to be integrated into the new uh, new procurement um, in, in different areas. So you have right now, uh, let's talk about warehouses, right? So at the bottom of the barrel, you have your, your kind of R2D2 guys that are uh, working in the, in the factories and kind of, you know, uh, using Amazon uses them from a shipment perspective. Uh, they're starting to use artificial intelligence in their warehouses, right? So to employ a robot is probably going to be less expensive and less costly than it is to, be, to use um, or to employ in you know, an actual human to do that job. That doesn't mean that, that jobs for humans are going to be non-existent. What it does mean is that the skill set of the human being has to evolve to some extent. So in other areas, where can this come into play here from a, an AI perspective? Um, really would be kind of managing supply chain risks. Uh, if you use something like a, like a Surrey, we know how easy it is to compile data very quickly. If you ask them, you know, where are the, where are the top 20, you know, or the closest 20 Starbucks locations, right? If I ask Surrey that within two minutes, I'll have, I'll have the top 20, you know, uh, closest to where I am today. So if we can use the ease of this data and we can, you know, apply it to identifying new markets, managing supply chain risks, um, you know, tracking exchange rate and the volatility, um, you know, we can do it also without compromising, you know, compromising on quality. Uh, we, all, we all go to computers every single day. Uh, we go to the Internet every single day for accuracy, so to take those concepts and apply them. Um, and we are at this point in time, you know, next generation for software and things of that nature in the procurement piece are going to probably be focused, um, you know, more so in the AI arena than they are in the traditional software that you see out there today. So stay tuned for that. Um, you can actually find out a little bit more about this, too, uh, on our website. Um, and then uh, I would certainly encourage you all, I think we're running just, uh, just shy of 1230 here. So um, I just I wanted to uh, thank you all to, you know, for, for joining us today and for listening to me talk about town acquisition in the last 45 minutes. Uh, I think that at this point, you know, I would say please connect with me on LinkedIn and let's, let's keep the conversation going after this. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dina, and I'm sorry for uh, any other questions that we didn't have uh, time to answer today. As Dina pointed out, we are right here at the 1230 Eastern uh, time mark for today's webinar. So we're going to wrap things up for today. Um, there's Dina's contact information on the screen that you can, uh, you can follow up with her. And I encourage you to do so. So first of all, Dina, thank you so much for being our guest presenter today. We appreciate GEP and uh, your contribution to, uh, to helping educate further the, uh, the members of the Next Level Purchasing Association. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And to everyone uh, in attendance, thank you all for attending today. Uh, just a quick heads up before we wrap up. Um, in October, we will not be doing uh, one of these monthly webinar, uh, members only webinars. Um, we will be having our conference in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania uh, next month. So uh, when we have our conference, we, uh, we skip the webinar. We will be very busy. Uh, preparing for our event, and uh, I hope to see uh, some, if not all of you, in Pittsburgh at that event next month. And for those of you we don't see uh, live and in person, we certainly look forward to seeing you uh, when we return in November for our online only webinar. So again, thank you very much on behalf of GEP, uh, Dina, our guest presenter, and uh, the entire staff of the Next Level Purchasing Association. We appreciate you joining us today, and uh, we'll talk with you soon. Good day, everyone.